afternoon and welcome to today's webcast. Our topic, how to use a CERTES channel simulator for PAM4 simulations and analysis, sponsored by Keysight Technologies, formerly Agilent Electronics Measurement Group. I'm Bill Wong, Technology Editor with Electronic Design. Let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. First of all, if you have any technical difficulties during today's session, simply hit F5 to refresh your webcast console. If you need assistance solving common issues, please click on the yellow help icon below the slides to maximize the slide presentation window. Press the small green button on the top right corner of the slide window. We welcome your questions today during today's event. Just type your question into the question window on the side of the screen and then hit the submit button. We will answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the main presentation. But please feel free to send your question. To be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the Electronic Design website within the next week. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. You may also download a PDF copy of the slides by clicking the green folder icon in the toolbar beneath the slides. Now, let me introduce today's speaker. Heidi Barnes is a senior application engineer for high-speed digital applications in the EESOF EDA group of Keysight Technologies, a spin-off of Agilent Technologies. Past experience includes over six years in signal integrity for ATE testing our test fixtures at Verigy, Advanced Test Group, and six years in RF and microwave microcircuit packaging for Keysight Technologies. She joined Keysight Technologies in 2012 and holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from the California Institute of Technology. Fang Yi Rao received his PhD in Physics from Northwestern University in 1997 for research in quantum theory of magnetism and transport. He joined Keysight EE, um, EDA in 2006 as a senior development engineer, where he works on analog RF simulations, technology in ABS and RFDE. From 2003 to 2006, he was with Cadence Design Systems, where he made key contributions to the company's flexible balance technology and perturbation analysis of nonlinear circuits. Prior to 2003, he worked in the areas of EM simulation, nonlinear device modeling, and optimization. Now, let me turn things over to our presenters. Heidi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bill. Great, let's go ahead and, and jump right into the presentation on PAM4, Pulse Amplitude Modulation. And as you can see here, we're going to be focusing on the Cerides Channel Simulator and how to do simulations of PAM4, this new emerging technology. And we will be using the Keysight ESOF EDA tool uh, called the Advanced Design System. If you haven't noticed, when we went from 10 gigabits uh, per second, the traditional NRZ, non-return to zero signaling, and moved to 25G, that was pretty tough. But this was a linear or evolutionary type change. The transition to 56 gigabit PAM4, pulse amplitude modulation, with four different levels is actually revolutionary, requiring some new technology in how we do simulations and in the technology being developed for the transmitters and receivers. The challenges with all of the different components in the channel, if you look at the package, the printed circuit board, the connectors, et cetera, the question is how will this work in such a complex uh, system when running the PAM4 uh, CERTES modulation. Initially, when all the channel components are put together, the eye could be completely closed. So how to go from a closed eye to an open eye? How will the receiver open the eye back up with equalization techniques? A complex system like this 
often, often has too many variables to look at efficiently without using simulation. Existing simulation technology is designed around NRZ, non-return to zero, uh, zero one type signaling for simulation and measurements. But this does not always work for PAM4, which will require some new techniques. And you can see here our uh, closed PAM4i, and then the question is, how do we open it up? And this is where simulations can become indispensable in working with the models for the transmitter and receivers and uh, running variations and, and what-ifs with the different channel components. So today's presentation will cover a little bit of basics. If you're new to PAM4, we'll, we'll go over how uh, that modulation signaling is done for a Cerides channel. Then we'll look specifically at how the PAM4 is being simulated with the IBIS AMI, mo IBIS AMI models in a channel simulator. We will then close with a real-world PAM4 example simulation and questions and answers. Here is a simple uh, graph. On the left is the, our traditional Cerides modulation scheme, often called uh, PAM2. There's two levels of signaling, 0 and 1. It's our NRZ, non-return to 0. And on the right is the example of the PAM4. And you can clearly see that there are four different levels uh, that can be used here in the PAM4 modulation. It, the PAM4 signaling is able to pack two bits per level. So each level is not, no longer just a single bit and is now called a symbol. And the symbol represents two bits of information. A 56 gigabit per second NRZ signal uh, is also, con uh, what is it? Each uh, is also a 56 gigabaud. But if you look at the PAM4, it, 56 gigabits per second, since you're transmitting two bits per symbol, only requires 26 gigabaud. Or another way of saying that is the clock rate for PAM is half of what is required for NRZ um, in terms of, of sending the same bits of information. So here you can see the 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 two different, the comparison of the two different uh, signals. Enabling the next step in the uh, linked data rate, 56 gigabit lane data rate will be the principal enable, enabler for 400 gigabit Ethernet. They're looking at, uh, for a 400 gigabit Ethernet, the, the buzz at o, the OIF or OFC conference, optical fiber conference this year, was that PAM4 would be one of those enablers for that. Basically, 56 gigabit per second NRZ is becoming very difficult. Um, you can see that that would be at the, uh, there's no new science here, but the loss at 56 gigabits per second is becoming significant, and by running PAM4 at 28 gigabaud, uh, you can use the lower bandwidth, and uh, there's less loss at that uh, uh, clock rate, or uh, 28, 28 gigabaud. However, uh, at PAM4, the transmitter and receiver technology is more complex and will require more real estate, more power, and because of the four levels fitting into the same uh, uh, voltage swing of the transmitter, you automatically lose about 10 dB signal to noise ratio. So essentially, the uh, loss, the added loss at 56 gigabit per, per second NRZ will have to be a lot more than, than 10 dB to justify switching to PAM4 at the uh, lower clock rate or uh, baud rate. So there are lots of new challenges with PAM4, but we're definitely seeing it the viability, and if we start looking at some of the specific standards uh, that are already implementing PAM4, 
This means that vendors are also starting to provide the transmitter receiver technology, and this is why simulations are, are start, or simulators are starting to adopt uh, PAM4 uh, capability with, with the new technology coming out. And the first one to adopt PAM4 or, or make it a, a viable option is the Ethernet standard 802.3.2014. This is the 100 gigabit Ethernet KBR specification, and it is running at 13.6 gigabaud. And again, you're seeing PAM4 being implemented in cases where there's a high degree of loss in the channel, and the NRZ uh, type signaling is struggling at the higher uh, day, uh, higher clock rate, and so by dropping it down to half that bandwidth with PAM4, um, here you can see it's being used for a long one meter back plane. There are addition, uh, initially there is a low adoption rate, partly because we're waiting for uh, the TX and RX technology from the vendors to catch up with the standards that are making this uh, uh, a possible option. Also under development, and you're seeing a, multiple other standards looking at adopting PAM4 and, and making it uh, uh, available in their standard. Here you can see OIF for the optical uh, fiber community, and also uh, InfiniBand, et cetera. So let's look at just a quick basics. If you're new to PAM4, it helps to have a little bit of a visualization. If we start, at the top graph here, you can see at the very uh, top PAM2, we call it, there's two levels of signaling, one bit per symbol, and you can see across the top a bit pattern, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, et cetera. And on the left is the signal level, uh, 0 and 1. So for each bit, there is, there is a single level. Uh, for each bit, it, we represent the, the level of that bit, and you can see the waveform for NRZ PAM2. If we go down to the next plot, we have that same bit pattern, but now we're going to implement it in PAM4. The uh, first two bits, 0, 1, are now combined into a symbol, and given the symbol uh, name, we start 0, 1 is a symbol 1, 1, 0 is a symbol 2, 0, 0 is a symbol 0, and uh, 1, 1 is a symbol 3, etc. We can recreate this waveform that we saw with NRZ PAM2 as a PAM4 waveform down below. Now, if you look, um, the levels on the left are mapped linearly from 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0 to 1, 1. And we use our PAM4 symbol, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, to map those. But if we look at the first symbol, 0, 1, and then the second uh, symbol, 1, 0, we realize that if there was any error in, uh, in, the, in the detection, say, of that 1, 0 level, if it was a mistaken for a 0, 1, we actually would get two bits of error. There's two bits changing between those two levels. So if you look at the bottom graph, the, there's an implementation called gray coding, where instead of putting the 0, 1 and 1, 0 levels adjacent, we now switch the 2 and 3 three levels, and we put the 1-1 one, one as the third level in our uh, PAM4. This is called gray coding, and it is a, uh, the symbols are in the 0, 1, 2, 3 mapping as we go up increasing levels. You'll see later on how this is important in setting up our simulator to reduce the amount of, of errors uh, potential errors in the, in the transmission of the bits. Excuse me there, I hit the button too many times. Now let's look at the spectral content. We, we can clearly see that two bits of information are transmitted for every symbol, uh, so we're at half the clock rate. We can look at the PAM4 signal up in the top, or left, top left here, and it's instructional to look at what a 50 gigabits per second PAM4 25 gigabaud uh, series modulation, how that would look in the frequency domain. Here you see the classic sync function roll-off uh, out to 125 gigahertz, but 
If you look at that same plot for 50 gigabits per second PAM2 NRZ, uh, traditional signal that we use, you can clearly see that a lot more spectral content um, out to uh, the 50 gigahertz, or it was at 25 gigahertz clock rate, a significant amount of amplitude is needed for our signal, whereas at uh, PAM4, uh, we're, our clock rate is down at 12.5 gigahertz, and uh, the, the bandwidth required is a lot less. The key here is that an existing channel that's used for 25 gigabits per second PAM2, we can now uh, use that for a 56 gigabaud. We can double the data rate without having to change the bandwidth of our channel. So we can use an existing channel that we've been using uh, for 20, 28 gigabit per second. We can double the data rate to 56 and not have to change the channel bandwidth if we go to PAM4. Another instructional thing is to look at how the eyewit uh, is generated with PAM4. If you look at the upper uh, left here, this is a, a creation of the PAM4i. And if you just simply draw, you have a, a finite rise time. And if you start at your transition uh, period and you have a finite rise time going from a 0 level to the 1, a 0 to the 2 level, a 0 to the 3 level, if you just connect all those transitions, you can clearly see that the, there is m more jitter with the PAM4 eyes and then the NRZ signal that's down below. Although the eye width is, is wider because you have uh, twice the uh, uh, unit interval uh, period or time versus the NRZ, the jitter is now taking up uh, a more significant portion of the unit interval. Also, if you notice with how the jitter is developing here, each eye is different and the top and bottom eyes are asymmetric. In the real world, there's also another problem called eye skew. Instead of just one eye to deal with, we now have three eyes, and there is nothing that says electrically that those three eyes will line up exactly uh, uh, vertically aligned. And so in both me measurement and simulation, the standards are looking at ways to, uh, for the clock data recovery to have that uh, a skew for each of the eyes as to when they'll be recovered. And then if you look at, at the case of, of, say, a VIXEL, a vertical cavity uh, it, uh, emitting laser, you'll see here that with a, a VIXEL device, the, um, their, the timing is actually amplitude dependent, and so the faster or the higher the amplitude, the faster the rise time, and this will result in a skew of, of the eye timing. Uh, or the phase between the three eyes. And so again, uh, your simulation will have to be able to adjust where that clock data recovery is happening depending on which eye is being recovered. Finally, we talked about this because of the four levels, uh, the PAM4 signal has less signal to noise ratio. The, the voltage uh, differential between levels is one-third of that of NRZ. It results in an automatic 10 dB or 9.6 dB more loss for the signal-to-noise ratio. And here, if you look at how, what might cause problems is if you look at the, if there's noise in the amplitude, uh, this will reduce our signal-to-noise ratio. And things like simple impedance discontinuities. Here's an example of we have a 100-ohm transmission line a differential transmission line coming into, say, a connector or a, uh, uh, a transition on a printed circuit board that's maybe only 50 ohms, so there's an impedance discontinuity that's about one inch long. This will cause a rippling effect in the frequency domain uh, versus magnitude versus frequency. This ripple in the frequency domain of reflections bouncing back and forth because of the impedance discontinuities will cause noise or amplitude variation in our time domain signal. 
And you can see here how on the left how it significantly closes the eye versus the uh, NRZ uh, PAM2 signal. What this means is even though the bandwidth is half for PAM4, we, we don't need as much bandwidth for the channel, however, we may be more sensitive to impedance discontinuity. So the transitions or maintaining the impedance of our channel uh, may be more critical for PAM4 versus traditional NRZ, uh, PAM2 NRZ. So in summary, some of the challenges for the PAM4 Serides design, uh, we, we focused on some of the, the basics, but also the transmitter and receiver uh, have uh, design challenges. There's nonlinearities in, in the transmitter uh, levels due to saturation. On the receiver side, we have clock data recovery, uh, where to put the slicer for the thresholds for the, for the uh, measurement of, of the bits or the symbols. There's also timing skews between the slicers. And also the analog-based architecture versus uh, a digital analog to digital converter-based architectures. So there's, there's competing technologies on how to actually generate the PAM4 uh, modulation. In simulation, the question is how to capture the more complex transmitter and receiver behaviors, and then how to measure the three stacked eyes that, of this new uh, modulation. So the choice for simulation, what, we're, what has been adopted is the IBIS AMI-based PAM4 link simulation. The reason for PAM, or IBIS provides a, a method so that we can use algorithmic models, uh, AMI models, to successfully bring Serides vendor models and EDA tools together. There's an interoperability. AMI defines a common interface between Serides models and channel simulators. And there's IP protection. These AMI models are compiled into DLLs on the Windows machines and a shared object or an SO on a Linux machine. There's superior simulation speed because they're a behavioral model. We're not having to run a full SPICE uh, netlist. And then also AMI has been widely adopted by IC vendors, uh, system developers, and EDA companies. And here you can see the uh, link for the IBIS website if you're not familiar with it. So how does an IBIS AMI flow work for a traditional NRZ? You can see you have your, your uh, bit pattern defined. It's fed into the transmitter model from the vendor, the DLL. And then output is a waveform that the simulation tool, the EDA company, uh, the channel simulator is then characterizes that channel and convolves the impulse of the channel with the output from the transmitter. This waveform is then fed into the RX model for clock data recovery and uh, detection or equalization techniques to open up the eye. And this is the traditional flow. This uh, year back, or this year in February at DesignCon 2015, Keysight joined with Xilinx and Huawei and our R&D expert Fang Yi Rao uh, worked with them closely to look at how can we actually implement PAM4 simulations using our channel simulator and the AMI uh, modeling capability. And so the paper at DesignCon, IBIS AMI Modeling and Simulation of 56 Gigabit, or yeah, gigab uh, Gigabod PAM4 Link Systems, um, this was presented, and the the suggestions for how to, mod, how to create those AMI models, what parameters are needed, uh, those suggestions were actually adopted in June uh, at the IBIS Open Forum. This was BIRD 175.3, and it will be in the next release of IBIS uh, 7.0. So how do we implement the AMI modeling for the PAM4 signaling? Well, the first item of business is to look at the levels. And the traditional IBIS uh, AMI models use a, a minus 0.5 and a positive 
five volts. So this is basically a one volt uh, swing for our levels. And for PAM4, so that we're not going to change the, uh, the format, we'll keep the minus 0.5 to 0.5 uh, total level swing and implement two intermediate levels at one-third. So we'll have uh, 0.5 divided by 3 or 0.166, minus 0.166, and a positive 0.166 level added for PAM4 capability. Okay. So the key thing here is that this leaves the, the TX uh, DLL unchanged for PAM4, going from NRZ to PAM4. The next uh, business is looking at the receiver, or the, uh, I'm sorry, the, is to actually tell the simulation tool that PAM4 is, is being used. Uh, so that the bit string, our, our um, uh, bit pattern, can be can be gener can generate either an NRZ or a PAM4 uh, symbol. So in this case, the default for the modulation is NRZ. The other one is the mapping that I told you about originally. There's nothing that says that the uh, 0, 1, 2, 3 symbols have to be mapped to specific levels. The default is the um, mapping of the gray coding, which is 0, 1, 3, 2, to provide a little bit better uh, uh, error tolerance. For the RX, the PAM4 RX symbol de decision relies on three slicers. And this is another thing that the simulation tool needs. It needs to know how to recover those individual eyes. It needs to know where those threshold levels are. So within the uh, AMI uh, specification, there needs to be an upper threshold, VU, a center threshold, VC, and a lower threshold, VL. The, these slicers may actually be time dependent, so that ability to vary them with time and then also to vary their levels. Uh, a, a good AMI model will have the, this definition built into that model and provide it to the simulator. So if, if the information is not provided by the model, then the simulation tool will have to guess at it. And so it's, it's best if the model can provide these uh, threshold settings for the slicer for recovering the optimum I. And then you can see down below also the phase or the offset of each of the eyes needs to be recovered. There's the PAM4 upper eye offset, PAM4 center eye offset, and PAM4 lower eye offset. Like we talked about before, there could be skew between the three stacked eyes. And the simulation tool needs to have the ability uh, to, to uh, measure the eye correctly and recover uh, each one of those eyes individually based upon how they're, they're skewed. The AMI simulation flow for PAM4, now if we look at back at our, our AMI uh, channel simulation, you'll see it, it follows the same traditional uh, method. We have a TX AMI model. We're going to take our, our uh, bit pattern and based upon our mapping that we specified, we'll transition that uh, bit pattern into the, the symbol pattern re required by the PAM4 TX model. That symbol pattern will be fed into the TX model. And then from the TX model from the vendor, that waveform will then be convolved with our channel impulse function in our EDA simulation tool. Then that waveform is fed into the RX model uh, provided by the vendor where the clock data recovery and CTLE, DFE, et cetera, will be uh, implemented. Here you can see the threshold levels. There's a small chart showing that the threshold levels as well as the, for the slicer, as well as the timing for the clock data recovery for the center of the eye. Uh, both of those can actually vary with time 
and you can actually output those in your simulator to see what their, their values are from the, uh, being passed by the models. After the simulation, you can generate your stacked I uh, diagram for PAM4, as well as bathtub curves for, for, in this case, it's not bit error rate anymore. It's actually symbol error rate, because you have two bits per symbol, and we're looking at the symbol error rate. So let's actually look at a real-world example here. Um, if we click on an AMI model in a simulator, you can see that all of the different parameters uh, that are uh, user-settable are available in your, your AMI uh, interface. And here you can see the modulation parameter that is new for, for this uh, uh, IBIS 7.0 that will be coming out. We've already implemented it in our ADS channel simulator. And we can take that modulation parameter, and uh, in this case, you can set it to NRZ or PAM4. If we set it to PAM4, then uh, we can go ahead and, and um, uh, run our, our PAM4 simulation. What this means is if it's set to PAM4, now we're able to, to actually measure these three stacked eyes, and you can see that uh, to measure the bathtubs, the symbol error rate contours individually for each of these three stacked eyes, we have to look at those different threshold levels. And here's uh, how the logic traces are computed in terms of the upper threshold um, for the upper eye, the uh, center uh, threshold, V center for the, the center eye, and V lower for the lower eye for the, those three thresholds. The horizontal uh, eye is centered at clock times plus offset to capture the clock data recovery behavior and skew. The vertical eye center is placed at thresholds um, VL, VC, and v, VU, VL, and VC to capture the slicer level function. So that's uh, a little bit of the details of how the individual eyes are recovered. The other thing that we need to do is, uh, in our simulation, we need to, to specify what uh, waveforms we want to capture and plot. The way the ADS channel simulator works, we have an eye probe that can be placed in our schematic. And what you're seeing here is that on the left, uh, the eye probe works the same for NRZ as for PAM4, but if PAM4 is specified, when you uh, plot a density plot or a bathtub curve, um, you will actually see that there, um, for instance, for the, bat, the bit air rate curves, there will be a lower eye, a center eye, and an upper eye waveform generated when that BER is, is selected. So here's our example, real world example of uh, PAM4 simulation. On the, the, this is an ADS schematic, and on the left is our transmitter AMI block feeding differentially into an S parameter block. In this case, the, the full channel is just lumped together into one behavioral S parameter, and then this uh, channel is then fed differentially into our RX AMI model block, and then the output is, is probed with an I probe. And we can run a channel simulation here of, of a million bits. But first, uh, it's always good to take a quick look at the channel in the frequency domain and verify uh, what loss characteristics are in there and what you might expect in this channel simulation. Here you can see that uh, at Nyquist, so in, in terms of uh, Nyquist for this channel, we're down at about getting close to um, uh, 2530 dB. And so this is a typical PAM4 channel where there is a lot of loss versus uh, frequency. And so therefore, uh, PAM4 is, is a, a, 
uh, viable technology here to try to uh, use a lower bandwidth and uh, avoid the higher losses of uh, PAM2 NRZ at the higher frequencies. So let's see how this works. Um, also, in terms of the simulation setup, There's the TX model, and we can set up, uh, we set the modulation scheme to PAM form, and then also uh, in the RX model, we set it to PAM form. So both the TX and the RX have this uh, parameter setting, as well as you can control uh, the different slicer threshold levels, or you can set it to the, the typical values or global settings. The results are shown here. After a channel simulation uh, using the PAM4, TX, and RX models with a given channel, you can see the classic uh, density plot here of the eye diagram, the three stacked eyes. Then on the right, you can see the, B, the symbol error rate, SER contours. And if you zoom in, you could actually see the three different uh, contours that were simulated, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 5, and 10 to the minus 4. On the left, you can see the uh, timing bathtub curve, and uh, based upon those three eyes, and you can see how those compare. And then on the right, bottom uh, lower right, you can see the AMI parameters. So any of the AMI parameters uh, that are specified in the model can be actually output as waveforms. We mentioned how the slicer thresholds, as well as the uh, timing phase are, uh, are time dependent, so you can actually plot those and see how they vary. Um, the summary is basically just the last value of what those uh, threshold values were. So in, in summary, before we move on to Q&A, we can clearly see that there are, uh, the PAM4 is getting written into a variety of CERTI standards. There are multiple chip vendors creating TX and RX devices with PAM4 capability. And so the expectation here is that PAM4 uh, popularity will continue to increase. And as more uh, Applications are explored. We'll also learn a lot more about what is needed for measurements and simulations in terms of, of what are the critical measurements and what are the critical or, or eye uh, analysis that needs to be done. But for now, we've got a great start with IBIS AMI channel simulation and the ability to capture both the TX and RX behavioral models and implement that in exploring uh, what is really needed in the channel and, and what PAM4 can really do in your application. So with that, I would like to turn the questions and answers over to, our, uh, to Dr. Rao, our R&D expert who actually implemented the PAM4 capability in our channel simulator in ADS. So uh, thank you. And Fang Yi, if you would like to go ahead and take over on the questions, that would be great. Well, thank you. This is Bill. Uh, before we begin the question and answer session, we'd uh, first like you to help us out and improve our webcast and answer a couple short questions about what you saw today. In the slide window, please select an answer that you feel best. Uh, starting with question one, please rate your overall satisfaction with this webcast. For our next question, Based on what you heard today, will advanced design systems have a value in your work? Next, will your current projects require a solution in this area of interest? Okay, and our next question. Ah, 
looks like they gave me more questions than uh, are on the slide. So I, that's it for the uh, questions that were interactive. But if you would please take a look at the exit survey, uh, possibly while the questions are going on, we would appreciate that. And now uh, we'll take a look at the questions that you have submitted. So with the first one, how is the pre and post and main taps done? Is it uh, different for conventional, or is it different from conventional NRZ pre and post? Okay, um, good question. Uh, um, I guess um, this question is actually for should actually be asked to the um, service vendor, not um, the um, EDA vendor. But I will try my best to um, to guess the uh, the answer. Uh, my guess is um, because the um, the FFEs are designed to uh, compensate the channel loss, so uh, it doesn't matter whether the um, signal is NRZ or uh, PAM4, and uh, they should be designed uh, in a similar way to the NRZ FFE. But again, I think the best uh, people to answer these questions are the uh, uh, service designers. OK. Um, does the ADS work with uh, all Certis vendors TAM4 models? Uh, yes. Uh, we, um, we actively work with our service vendors and uh, system companies to make sure that the uh, simulation approach we develop are, um, are uh, accepted by the major, um, major parties, um, including uh, IC companies and uh, um, the uh, uh, system companies. And uh, during our uh, development process, we um, uh, repeatedly uh, get uh, model prototypes uh, from IC vendor vendors, and we uh, run uh, extensive, extensive uh, tests on these models to make sure they work seamlessly with uh, ADS. Uh, will PAM4 be available as a design kit with AMI models in the future release of ADS? If so, uh, when might they be available? Um, right now, the um, AMI models are proprietary uh, to the um, IC vendors, and we have no right to distribute uh, those models with our product. So. Um, the best way to um, access this model is to contact the IC vendors and get the model directly from them. Once okay. you get the model, uh, uh, you can you can plug them in, load them into ADS, and run simulation. I see. Uh, we can pop back to slide ten. You talked about asymmetric top and bottom eyes. Uh, how do you define the thresholds for the upper and lower eye openings? Let me go back to slide 10. Uh, the thresholds, um, um, in, in the real service um, trip, um, the um, receiver um, uh, has its own uh, algorithm to determine the, the optimum um, uh, threshold uh, voltages. And that's why we uh, propose these um, reserve parameters called uh, upper, center, and lower uh, threshold uh, for the purpose uh, of um, uh, receiving the values of these thresholds uh, from the uh, receiver model. And then we can use that uh, 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 in the, uh, in the uh, symbol error rate calculations. Uh, now, um, although we recommend uh, receiver models to uh, provide this information back to the uh, EDA2. Uh, in the case that a model doesn't uh, provide the information, then the tool, uh, the simulator, will um, determine the uh, threshold internally. All right. And uh, that is uh, 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 based on the algorithm of uh, detecting the uh, crossing levels of each eye. I see. All right, for our next question, in the BER contour plot, do the three eyes get moved horizontally to allow for their individual skew? That's correct. OK. 
So uh, PAM4 takes uh, 9.6 dB off the top, no matter what the uh, protocol SNR. So if I have uh, 30 dB CERTES, uh, can I tolerate uh, minus 20 dB of insertion loss at my Nyquist? Um, <clears throat> based on some of the, uh, the simulation we have done so far, um, the um, CERTES chip out there is able to um, tolerate a minus 30 dB at Nyquist. Um, and, and even um, at a uh, loss higher than um, uh, uh, 20 dB, um, I think the studies, the currently available studies, uh, can handle that. Next question: Is there uh, an AVS generic PAM for TX and RX that can be used if a vendor is not ready? No. Yeah. And right uh, right now, the um, <coughs> the um, PAM for or studies design is. Uh, um, is uh, still uh, um, in the face of um, uh, uh, progressing and uh, is far from mature. And uh, also, um, the uh, architecture of the, the uh, PAM4 studies are top secrets of IC vendors. Um, so um, we have very little information of uh, uh, what goes inside the uh, service chips. So the best way to um, Design your channel uh, and simulate the performance is to get the uh, model from your uh, IC vendors. All right. Uh, how can nonlinearity be built into the simulation? Um, it's just like um, <clears throat> any um, any NRG um, AMI models um, uh, for nonlinear uh, behaviors. Um, the best way is to uh, for the model to provide the AMI gateway function, and then um, uh, inside the gateway, uh, you can introduce uh, and model the nonlinearities of the signal. Okay. Uh, are the PAM4 parameters in the IBIS AMI standard? Uh, yes. So the um, these parameters are uh, proposed to the um, IBIS uh, Open Forum, and and, and the proposal um, uh, was accepted, and it will be uh, rectified in the next uh, available um, next IBIS release. But the uh, uh, all the major um, IC vendors and the system companies are aware of these uh, these uh, parameters, and they. Uh, so they um, they all uh, all uh, adopt these uh, approaches. Okay, uh, here's one I like to find the answer to. Uh, can the ADS handle crosstalk in the PAM4 simulation? Uh, yes, uh, ADS um, handles crosstalks um, in both PAM4 and NRZ simulation in the same way, and uh, the the approach we took uh, uh, rigorous, uh, meaning uh, we we all <clears throat> include uh, uh, multiple paths and multiple reflection uh, in the signal, and um, therefore we can uh, uh, accurately uh, capture the uh, crosstalk effects. Okay. Um, can uh, EESOF system view tool uh, be used to generate a PAM4 IBIS AMI model? Um, the latest system view uh, has some um, building blocks uh, for PAM4 uh, signal processing, for example, uh, DFE and um, uh, CDR. And um, if a, a model developer knows um, the uh, architecture of the uh, uh, service chips, uh, he can um, use this uh, basic building block to uh, construct a um, receiver model easily and then convert the um, the design into uh, AMI models. All right, great. Uh, how can you translate the three uh, SAR symbol error rate numbers to two uh, BER performance numbers? Uh, at the end, we only need the two BER numbers for the two channels. Um, so that's uh, where the um, <coughs> the mapping uh, comes into the picture, mapping between um, 
uh, NRG and uh, PAM4. So um, from the uh, the error symbol <coughs> ray of uh, PAM4, uh, based on the mapping, we can uh, just uh, 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 convert it back to the uh, NRG bit error ray, and that conversion is uh, uh, straightforward. And uh, in the in the real um, uh, link design, um, uh, the, um, uh, the your first, first step is to uh, look at the individual uh, symbol array uh, for each uh, individual eye. Yeah. Make sure that all okay. the eyes are open. Yeah. Good. Uh, well, if we didn't get to your question, we will answer them via email. At this point, that concludes today's presentation. On behalf of Electronic Design, I'd like to thank you for jo uh, joining today's webcast. You're invited to attend our next event in the Tutorials on sig Signal Integrity webcast series. Thank you for Keysight Technologies to sponsor the event today with us. And everyone, please have a productive remainder of the day. Okay, are we clear?